He came to UW-Madison in 1961 and taught here for over 50 years. During his time at UW, he started a certificate program in LGBT studies, directed a year abroad in India program, and produced dozens of documentaries and articles about India, Gandhi, and other topics. He has been a guest lecturer on Gandhi in my UW Odyssey project for the last 12 years, reaching adults at the poverty level. He was honored in 2009 with a Lifetime Achievement Award for Peacemaking from the Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice. It's my great honor to introduce for a talk entitled, Is Gandhi Relevant Today? The absolutely inspirational Professor Joe Elder. Thank you, Emily, and thank all of you for coming. As Emily said, you sort of know the answer before I start. And so I could say, well, yeah, Gandhi's relevant. Uh, have a good afternoon. But it's a little more complicated than that, because I must say, uh, my initial experience with Gandhi and Gandhianism was pretty pessimistic. And so I'll start from there, and then we'll go on to where we are today. <clears throat> I never met Gandhi. I was a freshman in Oberlin College on January 30th. 1948, when Gandhi was killed, a little man with spectacles and a loincloth whom I had read about and who was reported to have led India to independence from Great Britain. Within hours of Gandhi's death, India's Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, spoke to the nation on all India radio. Friends and comrades, the light has gone out of our lives. And there is darkness everywhere. Our beloved leader, Bapu, is no more. And that is a terrible blow, not only to me, but to millions and millions in this country. Then Nehru went on to say, <clears throat> the light has gone out, I said, and yet I was wrong. For the light that shone in this country was no ordinary light. A thousand years later, the world will still see it, and it will give solace to innumerable hearts. Three years later, I myself was in India as an English teacher with a fellowship from Overland College. Four years later, I visited Gandhi's ashram in the center of India. It was pretty disillusioning. No one was farming. The irrigation Persian wheel had broken, and no one knew how to fix it. The ashram inhabitants were mostly trying to recover everything Gandhi had ever written for what turned out to be the 99 volumes collected works of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi may have led India to independence, but that was over. This certainly looked like the end of the road. I joined the UW faculty in 1961 in two departments, sociology and Indian studies. I found many students were interested in Gandhi Within a decade, I created a course called Thought of Gandhi. I had to learn a lot about Gandhi. Every year, one or two more books were published about Gandhi. The 99-volume collected works of Mahatma Gandhi were already on the UW Memorial Library shelves. I never read them all. I had one PhD student who did. It took her a year and a half. In the end, she wrote her dissertation on Gandhi and ecology. From teaching the Thought of Gandhi course over several decades, what did I learn about Gandhi? Well, we're going to go over a quick review. 19, 1869, he was born on October 2nd. That is now a national holiday in India. When Joanne and I arrived at the Bombay Harbor in 1951, India was celebrating Gandhi's birthday almost for the first time. And they were getting a kick out of the fact this was their holiday. This was not a, a British holiday. 1882, Gandhi went through an arranged marriage at the age of 13 to a girl from the same Modbanya caste, somewhere in the Vaishya Varna. And he accepted the way in which India had these hierarchical arrangements. <clears throat> in 1888, his uncle convinced him that the only way he would get ahead would be to go to England and become a lawyer. So that year, he sailed from Bombay to England, leaving behind him a wife and a small son. In Britain, he was what I would call a cultural Hindu. 
He was a vegetarian. He would not drink alcohol. He recognized he was from the Modbunya caste because they had outcasted him when he left and they had to incast him when he came back. In England, he read the Bhagavad Gita for the first time. His major companions were in a British vegetarian society. It was in Britain that he learned about the law of karma, which is the basic metaphysical premise of Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism. It's a faith that believes you've been born many times before and you will be born many times again until perhaps you are released. When Gandhi spoke about this, he said maybe in a future life he would be reborn as an untouchable. To try to find words where Gandhi expressed this notion of the metaphysical reality of the law of karma, he made a statement at the age 59, which I'm going to quote, which sort of captures in his words what he felt was the sort of moral undergirding of the society. Whilst everything around me is ever-changing, ever-dying, there is, underlying all that change, a living power that is changeless, that holds all together, that creates, dissolves, and recreates. And is this power benevolent or malevolent? I see it as purely benevolent. For I can see that in the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. And I think you capture Gandhi's notion of the law of karma, this law where every virtue is rewarded and every evil is punished because of a moral order that works something like the law of gravity. So to that extent, he was a cultural Hindu. He didn't understand a lot about it, but he accepted himself as a Hindu. He also was a cultural Jain. Jainism is not a faith with which most of us in America are familiar. The founder of Jainism, Lord Mahavir, walked in India about the same time Buddha did. They probably actually knew each other and they were wrestling with the question of if we are reborn again and again and again, how do we get off the cycle of reincarnation? Kind of the opposite of the question here of how does one have eternal life is how can I stop the eternal life because I've got more of it than I want. He was exposed to Jainism largely through his mother who had accepted a particular Jain mystic as her guru and also a younger man, a successful jewelry merchant who was a Jain. And I don't think Gandhi realized how much his version of what Hinduism was was colored by his connection with Jainism. Because in Jainism, the basic premise is the most important thing is to take no life. That to harm a living creature is an ultimate sin for which one will pay forever and ever. And Gandhi sort of merged this into Hinduism and kept using the central Jain concept of ahimsa as a Hindu feature. It's not that it's not, but ahimsa, himsa is violence, ah is the negation of violence. That is very much a Jain concept. And so throughout his life, when he kept referring to ahimsa as a Hindu doctrine, it really technically was much more a Jain doctrine. Gandhi spent three, two and a half years in Britain. He got his degree as a barrister and returned to India expecting to become a economically successful lawyer in Gujarat. His first cases were dismal. He did not do well as a lawyer. He finally found a job that meant he had to leave India and go to South Africa uh, to work out a case between two Muslim merchants. And what happened to Gandhi in South Africa was totally dramatic. He describes it in his autobiography. He bought a first-class train ticket he got, by the middle of the night, to the train station at Maritzburg, and a white South African told him he was not eligible to ride in the train because he was brown. He was from India. Gandhi insisted he'd purchased the ticket. And it was valid. He, had a, he was a barrister from England. And the conductor simply tossed Gandhi and his luggage off the train at Maritzburg. Gandhi describes that night at Maritzburg, Maritzburg as the event that changed his life. He could have gotten on the train and returned to Durban and sailed back to India, realizing that South Africa was extremely inhospitable, not only to Africans, but to Indians and people of other races. 
Or he could forge ahead and see what would happen, and this is what he did. Before the end of that year, he had founded the Natal Indian Congress for the Indian community in Natal, and they were insisting that they were members of the British Empire and they were entitled to the rights of white members of the British Empire. For the next several years, he became sort of a champion spokesperson for the Indian community in Natal and Transvaal. The white South Africans were passing increasing ordinances to separate and punish the brown or black South Africans. And there was finally something called the Asiatic Ordinance where every Indian had to carry an identity card so that if he was stopped, he could show that he was a legitimate discriminated against Asian living in South Africa. At that point, Gandhi noticed that oppressors depend upon the cooperation of the oppressed if they're going to oppress. So the way to stop oppression was not to cooperate. So he coined the term non-cooperation. This meant that you simply did not carry the pass. They couldn't make you do it, they could imprison you. But in the end, you had the power to resist. And as Gandhi worked with this notion of just collectively refusing to obey the law, he developed this notion of proactive, nonviolent collective action. Proactive, nonviolent collective action. He felt there was no English word for this, and certainly the terms I put together are very clumsy. It was not simple terms like not cooperating. That didn't have a lot of drama to it. It wasn't passive resistance. It was, was not conscientious objection. It was something more powerful. It was something that required force. And he wanted a word that captured that element of force. And so we had a competition and the term that was coined for this had not existed in any language before. It was satyagraha. Sat is the word for truth and agraha is a force. The notion that there is something that truth has that carries force. The idea that when one is engaged in conflict, one has one's notion of one's own position that it is true and probably feels that the opposition has only untruth, but the world is much more complicated. That I might think I have the truth, but in my position, there must be untruth because I am a human being. And in my opponent's position, there must be some truth, even though I think most of him is untrue. So the task in confrontation is to seek the truth from both of our sides until we come out with something which has the truth of both sides. And from this all, the notion that you work on this with the notion that there is a notion of force to this. So once you come out with a consolidated truth, then you are obliged to force change. So there was no English term for this, and the term satyagraha became the term that he used. Now, there's several debates that come up with this. If you engage in proactive, nonviolent collective action, do you do it because it is morally correct, or do you to it because it is instrumental. And this is the kind of ethical debate that can go on forever. Do you do this even if it seems to fail? Or do you do it only if it seems to work? And in Gandhi's view of the world, both features were true. It was principled, you should do it. It also was instrumental. The notion that the ends and the means are so closely linked that only by this nonviolent collective action will you get to a nonviolent collective solution. Up until now, Gandhi had not linked his effort to come up with definitions with literature with which we're familiar. But in 1907, Gandhi read David Thoreau's Civil Disobedience and found a lot in that essay that resonated. He translated into Gujarati, a feeling that people who read Gujarati should see that somebody in New England was wrestling with the same issues. And Gandhi took the lesson of civil disobedience as any citizen has a moral obligation to disobey his or her government if it requires you to implement injustice. In other words, one obeys the law until one sees one is being required 
to implement injustice. And at that time, one has a moral responsibility to say no. So Gandhi wove into Satyagraha David Thoreau's civil disobedience. A year later, he read some essays by Tolstoy. Tolstoy is known for his famous classical novels, but he also wrote, toward the end of his life, semi-mystical <laughs> stories. And they were included in a collection called The Kingdom of God is Within You. And in these short stories, Tolstoy kept indicating that if there was a core Christian principle, it was nonviolence. And in each of his stories, he indicated you could not be a serious Christian unless he refused to engage in violence. Gandhi found this very attractive, and he began to correspond with Tolstoy. And we have several letters that went between Gandhi and Tolstoy on this notion, this notion of where is the moral obligation to be nonviolent. And the thesis of both Tolstoy and Gandhi was violence itself generates violence. And when one generates violence, one is generating untruth. One is forcing people to do things that they would not do otherwise. And there will be either an actual or potential blowback. It simply will not work. 1909, Gandhi went to London to present the case for free tre fair treatment of Indians. He was profoundly disillusioned by his trip to England. He was a, a barrister. He was a leader of the Indian community in South Africa. And he found that he was simply put off time and again, uh, transferred to committees, not taken seriously. And on his return voyage, he wrote a book which had a profound effect on him. It was called Hind Swaraj. Swaraj meaning self-rule. And in it, he enunciated a concept that ancient India had the key answers to life's questions. That simple living, self-denial, acceptance of one's position in birth, all had moral benefits that the West had lost. The West had become competitive, it had begun manufacturing products, capitalism was inherently unequal. And if one were seriously interested in the moral life, one should establish a simple communal life. So for the rest of his life, Gandhi had communal ashrams. These were communities, intentional communities, where they practiced various forms of shared income earning and shared work. 1913, Gandhi organized what he called the Great March. This was an effort where he got 2,000 miners who were in the Natal section of South Africa to walk across the border into Transvaal and violate the laws be, and get themselves arrested to indicate how unfair it was that in one part of South Africa you had to have a passbook and in another you didn't. That was probably the notion of building up on the idea of large numbers of people engaging in these types of activity. In the end, the Gandhi was arrested three times in four days, which was something of a record. They'd arrest him and he'd get signed in and then get out and get arrested again. And the pressure of these 2,000 miners crossing the path, finally the general smuts to sign what he called the Indian Relief Act, which yielded to many of the claims of these, these miners and Gandhi. So Gandhi left South Africa in 1914 for the final time. He spent 21 years there, one would say probably the most youth, his youthful years, from ages 23 to 44. So it's sort of from the, the um, lab school of South Africa that he got to India. And now he began to experiment seriously with this proactive, nonviolent collective action called Satyagraha. In 1919, the British in India passed something they called the Rowlett Bills. The Indians had been hoping that after World War II and after Indians had served in the British Army, uh, Indians would move a little bit more towards self-rule. And the Rowlett Bills reversed the process. They said, we will continue to deal with India as though they are dangerous terrorists, and we will make it harder for them to be treated equally in the legal system. Gandhi and others felt this was unacceptable. And so they were going to resist the Rowlett Bills. He tried something. He called for one day the whole nation would strike. Nobody would go to work. Nobody would shop. Nobody would go to teach. Nobody would go to the post office. It was a disaster. There was violence that broke out in the Punjab. An English bank manager was killed. An English woman school teacher was killed. There was a British pushback. General Dyer went into a park and fired into a crowd of civilians. 
and the Jallianwala ba Bagh massacre occurred. Gandhi was horrified. This was the worst possible thing that could have happened. He announced to the world that he had made a Himalayan miscalculation, and he called off collective action, and his credibility was certainly under question. While he was pausing on what he should do next, the idea came up of boycotting English products. This was a little less risky because it meant simply not buying British products. So the slogan, boycott British goods, began to become the word of the day. And Gandhi himself stopped wearing European clothing and wear the cloth cotton garments of farmers in India. He fitted this into a large-scale economic effort to undercut the British Raj, because the British economy depended heavily on cotton from India and then India purchasing finished cloth products from Britain. And when you neither sold the cotton to Britain or you did not buy the British manufactured products, you began to dig into the economic advantage that Britain had. The boycotting of British goods continued from that time on. Then came 1921. Gandhi decided once again to try a major movement. He announced that there would be a movement for Indian self-rule within one year, and he called for mass civil disobedience. He hoped that people had learned from the one two years earlier that you had to be very, very careful in letting people loose. It also was a disaster. On February 15th, word came that in a village in Uttar Pradesh, Chauri Chaura, a group of Indian citizens had turned upon their policemen and hacked them literally to death. And Gandhi felt that the murder of those policemen was his responsibility. So he called off that campaign. The first two campaigns were disasters. And he said that India was a long way away from being ready for self-rule. Gandhi, Gandhi then spent jail time from 1921 to 1924. He was serving out a sentence. It was initially six years. He got time off for good, pay, good behavior. And it wasn't until 1930 that he decided once again to try this sort of massive movement of people against the British. This time he chose a particular target. It was the salt tax. The British monopoly was that the only salt you could buy in India was processed by the British and the money that was gained by the salt tax went to the British Treasury. It was a tax that every citizen in India had to pay every time they bought salt. At this point, Gandhi began to get other people supporting him, and probably the most important for a moment was a Muslim. This was a Muslim from the northwest frontier province, six foot something tall. Gandhi was about my height. And Abdul Ghaffar Khan was a leader of the Muslims, and he concluded that Gandhi's notion of nonviolent activism was inherent in the Islamic creed in the Quran. If you look at Muhammad and look at Muhammad's behavior, there was a tradition of courage where you would not bear arms against your enemies. So he began a group of Muslims up in the northwest frontier province called the Red Shirts, which was a kind of color they color their shirts. And when the salt march began, on the coast of India, the red shirts up in the northwest front frontier province began to take over the ruling of some of the communities in the area. They actually managed to control Peshawar. The British reacted very violently. The red shirts, many of them were killed, uh, and Abdul Ghaffar Khan himself was imprisoned. But from this, one of the most shocking things, when the British told their Indian troops to fire on the Muslims. The Gurwal rifles refused to do so. They said, these are our people. It was a total breakdown of British control. And for this brief period of time, the <clears throat> Red Shirts and Abdul Ghaffar Khan actually ran the town of Peshawar until the British came back in. The end of the Salt March probably was the only event that rain came fairly close to what Gandhi had said Satyagra should be because he sat down with Viceroy Irwin, and they worked out a compromise so that people were released from prison. The British still got revenue from the salt tax. People living on the coast of India were able to make their own salt, uh, and it was a, a way in which one could say the British needed some things, the Indians needed certain things, we could work this thing out. 
the drama, the drama was that here was the British viceroy talking to a man in a loincloth with sandals who had no political power. And if there was anybody that was really disturbed by that, it was Winston Churchill. It galled him to see the representative of the King of England talking to a person dressed like a peasant, but coming out with his treaty at the end. From 1932 to 1940, Gandhi was less active in this sort of massive effort. He was concerned about the relations between Hindus and Muslims in India and very concerned about the caste system. He was aware of the fact that untouchability was a stigma on the notion of fair treatment of people. And so he was, went to all kinds of efforts to rebuild Hindu-Muslim friendship and to eliminate the most severe discrimination against the untouchables. Then came World War II. World War II, there was the Quit India Movement the Indians said the British should simply leave. The British said that wasn't going to happen. And so for most of the rest of the war, Gandhi and the other members of the Congress party were in prison. And the war ended. And then the major event in terms of British history in India was the election in Britain, uh, which sent the Churchill and his party out and Clement Attlee and the Labour government in. And then the decision was made by the Labour Party for an early realization of self-government in India. So that was a critical decision. It was made by English voters uh, rather than somebody in India itself. August 15, 1947, two nations of birds, India and Pakistan, Gandhi was sorely distressed. He felt he had failed. There were two countries instead of one. There was a massive exodus of Hindus from Pakistan, from Muslims from India, uh, and who knows how many lost their lives. He felt he had failed. He was assassinated four months later. So that brings us sort of up to the question, what is Gandhi's relevance today? I would say that probably as it has turned out to be, and this was not clear when I was in the ashram in 1953, that the idea of proactive, nonviolent collective action acquired traction, this concept of satyagraha. It was a time when many nations were trying to get rid of their colonial masters. There were violent struggles for national independence against the Dutch, the French, and the British. You saw this in Indonesia, Malaysia, Laos, Vietnam. You saw it in Africa with the French trying to hold the Algerians. A very bloody period. But also there were more and more countries that received their independence from their masters because the masters realized the time was up. There was no point in staying more as the outside colonies. And then you begin to have what seems to be the sort of flow of this idea into a variety of different directions. The Civil Rights Movement and Dr. Martin Luther King, his own awareness of Gandhi was interesting because he was sort of essentially an undergraduate when he heard a sermon by a Baptist minister describing Gandhi as doing truly Christian things and at that time, just Martin Luther King, it wasn't Dr. Martin Luther King, began to get interested in this process over in India. When he had become a clergyman in Montgomery, Alabama, and was working with the NAACP and Rosa Parks, the idea of the bus boycott came onto the agenda. And the notion of how do you do a nonviolent boycott led him once again to look at what Gandhi had been involved with. After Gandhi's death, King went to India from February to March in 1959. And there he really sort of said, there's, a, there's a, some principles here that Gandhi had worked on that I did not see earlier as a Christian clergyman. And the notion of collective nonviolent action began to emerge as a principle that could be and eventually was adopted in the civil rights movement. In addition to what was already on the agenda was a notion of training satyagraha, satyagrahis, those who engage in satyagraha. Aware that when you get a lot of people moving, people can get out of control, people are in intense situations they're unaware of. The notion that you should, if you are going to engage in these campaigns, you should go through the, the physical, emotional practice of what happens when you were spat upon, when you were insulted, when you're physically harmed. And that was probably one of the additions that was brought into the civil rights movement, training for those participating in these kinds of activities. 
Another American figure who picked up on the notion that Gandhi had was Cesar Chavez. And if one wants to see the usefulness of a boycott, we think back to the years from 1970 to 1975, when there was a grape, grape boycott, and it was a moral boycott by Cesar Chavez and, and his colleagues who were trying to get recognition for the United Farm Workers. There was much of Gandhi in the symbolism that Cesar Chavez used, uh, including for a period some fasting that Cesar Chavez engaged in. The consumer boycott was effective. There was a 15% drop in grape consumption, and the United Farm Workers were ultimately accepted. I still remember the summer after the boycott ended, being in our home with a young boy who's lived in California, and we were serving grapes. And he looked at the grapes like it was some sort of poison. And he said, can we touch those grapes? And his mother said, yes, you can touch those grapes. The boycott's over. And I hadn't realized how deeply this refusal to use grapes because of Cesar Chavez had reached into even the American home. Another figure that wrestled with these same issues was Nelson Mandela, and in many of the same sort of categories. Nelson Mandela adopted the principles from Gandhi and from Dr. Martin Luther King and the notion that nonviolence was the way to go. And he found it so extraordinarily difficult to achieve anything with the African government that he finally concluded that this will not work. Nonviolence is not going to do it. And he joined the armed struggle of the African National Congress against the government. The price he paid was being found guilty of terrorism and serving 27 years on Robben Island. It was interesting when South Africa was on the brink of acknowledging the end of apartheid, that Nelson Mandela was allowed off Robben Island, but only on condition that he renounced violence. That even at that point, technically, he was still committed to using violence, and the South African government felt they couldn't release him if that was still part of his philosophy. Key things that happened, the boycott of international agencies had been affected. The internal boycott in South Africa itself was important, where black communities refused to buy products from their white communities. There was a Jack M. Kuseli who in the <clears throat> town of Port Elizabeth led a boycott for two or three years where it simply made it clear to the white store owners in Port Elizabeth that until apartheid ended, they would not be able to sell things to the African community. The end of apartheid came when President Bota resigned. President de Klerk replaced him. Nelson Mandela did say that he was renouncing violence and he was freed from prison. Then there were elections and Nelson Mandela was elected. And we've seen the impressive role he played in terms of forgiving those who'd been so harsh on him. One might look at all of these that we've just looked at and say, well, there's kind of a continuity. These were people in sort of a Christian Western heritage. They were watching these kinds of things. It was a surprise success of this nonviolent active cooperation that I've been particularly impressed by. 1979, Iranians wanted to overthrow the Shah. When one looks at the statements that the Ayatollah Khomeini made urging the Iranians not to use violence, it could almost have been said by Gandhi. Let me give a quote from Ayatollah Khomeini on the brink of driving the Shah out of Iran. O brave Iranian nation, my aim is to solve the problem of Iran and bring about the downfall of the Shah's regime non-violently. If anybody wants to engage in violence or to kill people, you must prevent them. The Ayatollah was aware when things get tough, the temptation is to kill. And he said, we will win this battle against the Shah, and we will do it nonviolently. 1980, in Poland, at the Gdansk shipyard, there was the victory of the Solidarity Union with Lech Walesa. Kind of unexpected, but by adopting persistent non-cooperation, the union was formed despite the resistance by the government. 
1989, there was a violent, the Velvet Revolution that overthrew the communist government in what was then Czechoslovakia. In 1986, Cory Aquino in the Philippines carried out a nonviolent restoration of power. 1999, the fall of the Berlin Wall. This is one of those sort of mysteries that didn't seem predictable, and then suddenly it happened. And yet as a story is spelled out of what went into the way in which the wall collapsed, there were many people working carefully to set the groundwork for that wall to go. 2004, the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, where there had been a rigged election, and it was quite clear that the rigging meant that the election was not valid, and people took to the streets, and there was another election, and it was recognized as authentic. All of these efforts were not successful. One has to, just any technique that one uses, one has to be a little bit cautious about where they work out. Probably the one I'm saddest about, because it failed so completely, was from Gandhi's colleague Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. He was a tall, six-foot-something Patan who worked with Gandhi, and who at the time of the Salt March led his red shirts uh, to acquire sort of nonviolent control of Peshawar and other cities in the Northwest Frontier Province. Abdul Ghaffar Khan wanted a separate state of the Northwest Frontier Province. He felt the language was one, the people were one, they had a heritage, and they should be allowed to have a separate state. So that as India became India, he was opposed initially to any partition, India and Pakistan should remain the same, and then if Pakistan came into existence, there should be a separate country, which would be the Northwest Frontier Province. The Pakistan government was firmly opposed to this. They imprisoned him, they would let him out, he would go right back and urge the establishment of the Northwest Frontier Province, and he'd go back to prison. He spent the entire rest of his life in prisons in Pakistan. A year before his death at the age of 98, he was allowed to come out, and he went to India, and India honored him with the honors that India could. But he did die in prison, a person whose plan never was achieved, so this is not a guaranteed path for success. There are other current situations that are kind of under consideration. One looks at the Dalai Lama, and here is a case where the pattern is much the same. Dalai Lama began by asking for an autonomous Tibet. That was not to be achieved. Then he asked for greater participation of Tibetans in the government. He, was, he received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989, uh, and as the years have passed, it seemed even less and less likely that there ever would be something like either an independent Tibet or an autonomous region for Tibet. The honors that he received were for his persistence, but will that ever happen or not? We still have to wait. That's an unanswered question. In the meantime, it's interesting to watch what's happening to the concept of the Dalai Lama. There is a suggestion that maybe the time has come for even the institution to disappear because perhaps it has served its time. Another ongoing situation is in Burma or Myanmar. There were Aung San Suu Kyi for years persisted in her effort to create democracy in what was then Burma or Myanmar. That's kind of halfway there, but it's still not fully resolved. She received the 1991 Nobel Peace Prize when she was still in prison. The moment she has a position in parliament, but Myanmar is not yet the democracy that she wants. Other ongoing situations, in 2005, the Palestinians called for boycott, divestments, and sanctions, the BDS, against things that were manufactured in the West Bank, feeling that so long as that happens, their lack of statehood continues to be unacceptable. European countries have adopted the boycott, divestment, and sanctions much more than the United States has, but it is on the agenda as a way in which one can, could bring pressure for the continued continued effort to have a Palestinian state. 2011, the Arab Spring brought big hopes and also big disappointments. Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Syria, each one for a short time appeared to be moving in the direction that one would be in favor of, and the disappointments there have been serious, and especially in the case of Syria, 
tragic. Other similar events that have drawn upon this tradition of active, nonviolent movements include even the Occupy Wall Street movement, which for a period of time held the attention of the US, and still there are concerns what about the massive inequalities between the richest in the United States and those who are so far underprivileged with so little money. The Hong Kong student protests in 2014, the Umbrella Movement, was a similar case where people decided to use these strategies. This again was an effort to introduce greater democracy into Hong Kong. I want to touch on one event which seems a little bit off of the margin, but this has to do with the US Supreme Court ruling on marriage equality. If one goes back 30 years, one would say the notion that in 2015 there would be a decision that would say gays and lesbians could marry, it would seem totally absurd. Over the 20 years, the notion that people of all variations are entitled to select the partner they want to marry uh, has become the law of the land. A figure here who has paid a part that if one has been in the movement, one has noticed it, is Reverend Mel White. Reverend Mel White was a clergyman. He was very critical of homosexuality. He lent his support to those who were attacking it until he realized that he himself was gay. And then how does one remain a Christian and how does one remain in the church when one is a gay Christian? The book he wrote called Stranger at the Gate to be Gay and Christian in America in 1994 sort of raised the dialogue in a United States that was not yet in 1994 particularly open to these kinds of things. He established a movement called Soul Force and it was a direct copy of Satyagraha. On the stationery that they used, there was a picture of Gandhi and a picture of Martin Luther King and then Mel White said, we are using this notion of seeking truth together to come out with something which is fair for everybody. The Soul Force movement set up programs where they would typically confront churches that were particularly reluctant to accept gays, lesbians, and transgenders and get into dialogue with them. Sometimes these would result in imprisonment, often a great deal of tension, but the notion that just as Satyagraha says, this is a force, and just as Martin Luther King said, we, we want to keep pressure going, so Mel White and his Soul Force movement said, this is an issue that we need to keep moving. To think about winding up this lecture, where does Gandhi stand today? Again, going back to my visit to his ashram in 1953, at that time it looked like it had sort of died there in the ashram. But I think this notion of a strategy for bringing people into action, looking for forcing change, using nonviolence, has a kind of resonance in a world with so many different groups and so many different needs. Along this line, there are academic reactions to this. The beginning of research groups and, and school programs that address peace studies. In Norway, there's the International Peace Research Associates that have been looking at how does one address these conflict situations, and there are branches of that in Ann Arbor and Philadelphia. Law schools have introduced courses in mediation and arbitration. Then in the world, we've seen the International Criminal Court and efforts to defend define crimes against humanity, so these things actually could be used in court cases. When one looks at the canon of texts that are used in these courses, it's interesting that there already is sort of a series of books, almost all of them dealing with Gandhi. The first one of the canon is Joan Bondurant's book called Conquest of Violence, the Gandhian Philosophy of Conflict. Virtually every one of these courses lists her book. Then there's Jean Sharp's book, 1975 called The Politics of Nonviolent Action, in which in hundreds of pages he lists a whole variety of ways in which historically nonviolent activities have been used to try to implement change. A very well-known book is the Roger Fisher, William Uri, Bruce Patton, Getting to Yes, Negotiating Agreement Without Giving In. That was published first in 1981. It's now in at least its third edition, sold eight million copies, 
been translated into 30 languages. And you read that book and it essentially sort of elaborates on Gandhi's notion of untruth on both sides, truth on both sides, and how do you negotiate something where you have a common truth. For those who are impressed with encyclopedia, there is now an encyclopedia of violence, peace, and conflict. Each volume is about that thick. There are three of them. It came out in 1999. And the listing of topics is fascinating. There are this many ways in which one can look at violence, peace, and conflict. The one that interested me as much as anything was as a chapter on structural violence. How does one identify societies which built into them just the nature of the economy and politics works is generating violence? In 2006, there was a, another version of this. There are directories of peace studies. The one that I have came out in 2006. It was a sixth, seventh edition, and it shows literally dozens and dozens of courses taught in Europe, in the United States, and Canada on dimensions of peace studies and conflict resolution. And throughout each of these, there's this some version of Satyagraha and some reference to Gandhi. So is Gandhi relevant today? Proactive, nonviolent collective action, which could be called Satyagraha campaigns or boycotts, have at times effectively achieved desirable goals and at times they have failed. Probably one of the important things Gandhi did was to show that it could be effective. The notion that you could have the British Raj leave India largely because of this collective nonviolent action is a testimony to the way in which history can move. When one looks at the scene today, one looks for situations in which this, po this policy might be used. Are there situations now that we can think of in which proactive, nonviolent collective action might be effective or in which Satyagraha could be effective? And the follow-up question is, if so, how do we do it? And we look around and I simply pulled a few sort of off the newspaper. How about protecting tribal lands in northern Wisconsin? How about preventing the pollution of air and water in the nation and in the planet? How about ending the use of drones to kill human targets anywhere in the world? The unprecedented principles of the violation of human rights and the appalling implications of drones if all nations started using drones. So the wind-up is that there are plenty of contemporary issues for which Gandhi's proactive nonviolent collection action might be relevant. Just look around. Thank you. <laughs>